welcome you. We have a new song this week, so what we're going to do, we're going to sing the chorus for you once, and you guys can join in, sing it with us, and then we'll go right into the song. Let's stand, let's start worshiping. And it's a little country-ish, so you might want to get your boots on.
If there are any kids who would like to come down for kids' time, that would be very awesome. Come on over and have a seat. I have something to show you guys today. Oh, good to see you. All right. I was feeling a little lonely for a few minutes. I guess to like me anymore because I've gone for a few weeks. Well, I have something to show you here. I have a couple pictures. And this one is a picture of my dog whose name is Ivy. Okay. And this one is a picture of my dog whose name is Henry. Okay. You can see this we're taking in the winter because it's snowy out, right? So I brought these pictures of my dogs because I had a couple questions for you guys. What can I, you know, like I really like my dogs. I bet if you have a pet, you really like your pet. So what can I do to keep my dogs healthy? What's something I should do to keep my dogs healthy? Camel. Feed them every day some like good dog food, right? Yeah. Give them some water. They have plenty of water to drink. That's good. What else? Yeah, take them on a walk so they can get some exercise. And if they get sick, then what do I have to do? Hmm? Yes. Take them to the... Take them to the vet, right, because that's all these things. Like, these are my dogs and they're my responsibilities, so I have to do these things to keep them healthy. And you know, God wants us to be healthy like that too. And, and we're sort of responsible for taking care of ourselves because he gave us this wonderful body to live in. So what are some things we need to do to stay healthy? Who has an idea? Joy? Eat healthy foods. Very good. Exercise. And take some naps, yes, and what else? <laughs> and drink milk so you have strong bones your whole life. And water is very important. You guys have lots of good ideas. And if we don't feel good, we need to go to the doctor too, don't we? That is exactly right. And you know, in the Bible, in Corinthians, it even says this. Listen to this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and which isn't even your own, and you're supposed to take good care of it? So when you guys saw, I want you guys to tell me that you're going to eat healthy food, drink milk, drink water, and exercise. Go to the doctor if you're not feeling good. Can you all promise you're going to try and do those things? And I will too, especially exercise and eat healthy foods. Well, that's my two worst things. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you care about all of us, even our bodies. Help us to make good, healthy choices about how to take care of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in the lesson, it suggested that I bring my dog, but if I brought this dog, it would get pretty crazy in here. He's very wild, so I had to bring a picture. All right, you guys, go sit down. Thank you for coming up. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Westminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you're here. And if you're here for the very first time, I, I don't wear this every Sunday, but it's Get Fit Physically Sunday, so I figured I'd at least dress the part. Um, but we have friendship pads. They're red. They're in your pews. If you could pull those out, sign them, pass them down, take note of who's worshiping with you this morning. We have a few announcements, as always. Um, first one is the 4th of July is coming up. And the church has put together water, bo water bottles that have the church name and a little message on the outside. And we need some people to help hand those out at the 4th of July parades in Rockford and in Roscoe. So if you are that person, you can call the church office and um, we will get you hooked up with that group. We also have a mobile food pantry coming up at the State Line campus that's going to be on July 9th from 5 to 7. And you can let one of the pastors know if you'd like to be a part of that or call the church office as well. I want to celebrate a couple uh, exciting things that happened last week. We had State Line Kids Camp, which is an all-day camp up at the State Line campus where they learn about God and do all sorts of fun stuff. And that was a great week. Pastor Brad was up there all week as well as some staff out from Stronghold. Um, and they had a great time, so we want to celebrate that. And I also want to celebrate we had uh, groups of 18 on Wednesday and Thursday nights volunteering at ShareFest, which is Heartland's uh, school makeover project and they're at Roosevelt High School and downtown Rockford actually this year so want to celebrate that as well. We have a new members class coming up 
and that's going to be on July 13th and 20th. So those are Sunday mornings. If you'd like to be a part of that, um, either join the church or get to know a little bit more about the church, it's going to meet in the library, which is directly behind the sound booth there, at 10 a.m. on both of those Sundays, and you can just let the church office know if you want to be a part of that. We also have a new class coming next week for adult ed during our 1015 hour in the choir room that's going to be part of our connect series and it's going to be about Christian denominations so if you're interested in the little nuances between a whole bunch of Christian denominations please join us next week for that class in between services we also had a member of our congregation Judy Smith pass last week and her service is going to be on Tuesday at 2 o'clock at Sunset Funeral Home. So if you are uh, able to make it and celebrate Judy's life, that's when it will be. Will you please pray with me? God, we come to you this morning excited about a, a great day outside and about the summer. And Lord, we ask that um, with our excitement that we not forget that you are at the center of our lives, God. We ask that you would forgive us for any sins that we committed over the past week, past month, past year. God, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that um, you would give us a second chance, as you always do. God, we thank you for the great opportunity and privilege that it is to be here this morning, to be able to worship you in freedom and in spirit and in truth. And God, we ask that um, you would help our minds and our hearts to focus on you as we hear from you this morning. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Hebrews 12, and it's verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Well, initially, you know, I had had this way dynamic introduction plan today, very energetic. You know, I was maybe going to run in here or run a couple laps around the sanctuary or do a, do a couple miles on the treadmill while I preach to you. But um, quite honestly, the last couple of weeks for me have been a lot more about rest and healing than running. Uh, as some of you know, I had a, a marathon plan to run, um, not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before, and I was all set and ready to do it physically, but I got sick um, a couple days before, and you can kind of still hear it, I still kind of sound like a guy. Um, but I, I, was, I got a sinus infection, I wasn't sure I was even going to be able to run at all, but long story short, I was able to do it, although I ended up running a lot slower and a lot less competitively than I had hoped, but I share this with you this morning because the Christian life is uh, truly unique, but it's all about balance. And so the only ruthless, unwavering, and unchanging commitment in our lives is to Christ. But many other of the other areas of our lives that we've been talking about throughout this series are our family life, our sex life, physical fitness, intellectual commitments, finances, etc. They're all a balancing act. And so normally my life is, you know, very much about running, but the past two weeks it's been a lot more about rest and healing. And so I just share this with you to remind you that as we talk about these areas of physical fitness in our lives that while there's always things that we can strive to do better, it's really an individual journey um, and it's a balancing act for all of us. Today I'm going to talk about three areas of physical fitness and as I talk about them I encourage you to target just one of them in the following week. Um, we have those workout plans for you in your bulletins, but I give you permission to not fill out the entire plan this week, but to just focus on one area that you want to dedicate yourself to and making some changes and start there. Two more notes before I get into, get into those three areas. Um, I think it's always helpful to have goals when you're making changes in your life. And in our spiritual life, I think we have a primary and a secondary goal. The primary goal would be to follow Christ, but we all know that we all sin and we fall short of the glory of God. And so there, there's this other secondary goal that when we sin, our secondary goal is to repent and ask God for forgiveness and ask forgiveness of those around us. And likewise, in, in a marathon, I always have a primary goal and that's this, this time that I really want to hit. And I might not even tell it to any of you because I don't know if I can really do it. Um, but I always have a secondary goal too and that's a time that I know I can hit. So that when things are not going well, maybe at mile 25, that way I'll, I'll keep running. 
So um, that's something that I encourage you to, as we talk about these areas of physical fitness, to come up with a primary and a secondary goal. And the second thing is that we're not asked to make changes in a vacuum or on our own. And so we need to lean on God when we make these changes in our lives and to lean on others. So I would encourage you, if you're trying to make a big change, to find a friend, somebody that maybe wants to make that same change, or even somebody who doesn't want to make that same change but is willing to support you and keep you accountable. Well, when Bill, Brad, and I were planning this sermon series, Bill absolutely insisted that I be on to preach on this Sunday on getting fit physically. And of course, I was happy to, but I think the thing that we often forget is that physical fitness has a lot more to do with just ex than just exercise. And the first component of physical fitness that we're going to talk about today is something that I'm admittedly not always that good at, and that is rest. So... There's a scripture passage in Isaiah that I'm sure you've heard. It's Isaiah 40, 29 through 31. And it talks about what happens to us when we don't get enough rest. And it says that we grow weary or become exhausted. You see, God has actually fashioned or fabricated our bodies to tell us when we're tired. We have symptoms like droopy eyes, yawns, muscle aches, and even falling asleep while standing up. That'll tell you that you are tired. Now, the Bible talks about several different kinds of rest that our body needs, and the first is sleep. So the Bible references sleep, which sleep can be defined as lying dormant, inactive, suspending all bodily functions, and it often takes place at night for a lot of us. Psalm 127 verse 2 states this, It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Jesus slept. Jesus even slept through a great storm on the sea when the boat was covered with waves and his disciples desperately wanted him to wake up. You see, our bodies are not made to be awake and alert at all times, and sleep is the body's chance to rejuvenate and recharge for another period of productivity. Some of us claim that we can get by with very little or no sleep, but to really claim that we don't need sleep is to claim to be God. For it is only God who does not sleep and does not need sleep. And we find that out in the Psalms. To be healthy as humans, we need physical rest. We need to allow our bodies to take a break. There are certain times in our lives when we get less sleep, like during midterms or finals, maybe a new baby, being sick, or periods of extreme stress. But in general, sleep needs to be something that we carve out time for. By contrast, if we oversleep, if we sleep way more than eight to 10 hours, it may indicate depression or avoidance of the awake moments of our lives. Physical rest for six to 10 hours a day is normal, natural, and healthy. And we need to safeguard this time for ourselves and for our children so that our awake is just that. It's a period where we can function on school, work, others, and God. A second type of rest that the Bible speaks about is Sabbath. And Sabbath, you probably remember, is from the Old Testament. It means completely abstaining from work for an entire day. In the case of the Jews, this was on Saturday. So they made all the preparations the night before so that they could completely rest on this day, modeling a pattern set for them by God during the creation of the world in Genesis. Now, I've heard all sorts of arguments by Christians today to avoid the concept of Sabbath in their lives, and most of them usually center around the fact that Sabbath was an Old Testament law, so it's no longer valid under Jesus and the new law. Well, it may have changed under the new law, but Jesus himself said that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it in Matthew 5.17. And of course, this, this verse has much more to do with than just Sabbath, but we find that Jesus has a distinct value for rest. In fact, Jesus invites us to come to him for rest. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus says this, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what do we need rest from? Well, heavy burdens. And heavy burdens could mean a lot of things. It could be family stress, work, maybe even our expectations of ourselves. We require rest and it's not always the same thing as sleep. You could sleep for eight hours a day and not be rested. Because rest means making time for things that allow us to relax and rejuvenate. And this looks different for everyone. And some of us are simply just quite bad at this. We feel guilty when we're not working. 
but Jesus invites us to rest and the Old Testament Jewish laws actually commanded it. There are even scientific studies that show that while we use the word epiphany to describe a genius thought or solution that just comes out of nowhere, these genius thoughts and solutions are often the direct product of unconscious activity during downtime for our brains. Bringing me to my final point that in addition to keeping us healthy, functioning, and perhaps happier, rest is a key opportunity to connect with God. You can just raise your hands on this one. How many of you have heard from God during a dream or during some quiet time? Whoa, lots of hands, yeah. The Bible is just full of examples of how God spoke to ordinary people like Joseph, both Josephs actually, Jacob and Daniel through dreams. It's also admittedly difficult to hear from God when we don't stop talking or thinking our own thoughts, even for a moment. Rest doesn't always look the same or mean the same thing for everyone, but it is an important element of becoming and staying physically fit. A second element of becoming and staying physically fit is eating right. And even though this is another area that I could do better in, yes, I've been known to do Taco Bell runs in the office, I'm convinced that there are two main areas of importance when it comes to eating right. The first is the what, and the second is the when. The what to eating right is it matters what we put into our bodies. With the amount of nutritional information out there, it's pretty difficult to claim that we're still not sure if something is good for us or not. With the exception of a few choice foods like red wine and chocolate and coffee, which researchers just seem to go back and forth on all the time, most of the time we can either glance at the back of the box or we can go on the internet and Google and figure out whether something is healthy or unhealthy. Well, the what of biblical times was a little less clear. We know that the original dietary laws, some of them, were due to protection from certain animals that were thought to or did carry diseases. And we also know that early Christians sometimes avoided meat that had been used in pagan sacrifices. But scholars also suspect that many early Christians ate a lot of fish. Perhaps it was because they were poor, or maybe it was because, remember, that fish symbol was the symbol of the faith. But this brings up an important point. The diet of early Christians was anything but what we would associate the word diet with today. They ate was what was indigenous to the area, for the most part, and likely what they could afford or find. Overeating was neither common nor possible for most. While we have the privilege and extra challenge of deciding what to eat today, most early Christians probably did not have that luxury or even need to limit their eating. The Bible does, however, make this distinction when it comes to drinking. Jesus himself drank wine and even changed water into wine during the special occasion of a wedding. But the Bible also makes it clear that wine to excess, dr excess drunkenness is sinful. So if the first part of staying physically fit by eating healthy is the what, the second part would be the when. Now not when as in when you eat breakfast or when you eat dinner, not time-wise, but when on how frequently we indulge ourselves in the luxuries of North American eating. The Bible may not be completely clear about whether donuts or cookies are a good thing or not, but it is clear that discipline is a big part of Christian living. In the case of eating, when to indulge and when to restrain. The Bible does speak of banquets and lavish meals, but these were reserved for celebrations and they weren't everyday occurrences. So we need to get fit by practicing discipline in our eating habits, paying attention to what we're eating and how often we're eating it. Finally, just like rest was a key opportunity to connect with God, so is eating. I'm sure many of you have felt a special connection to God during a communion meal. When we eat bread and we drink wine or juice, we use the human action of eating to spiritually connect with Jesus Christ. Similarly, food brings us together with others. It's no accident that food is often a main component to Christian fellowship. Jesus invited himself to eat a meal with outcasts and sinners, as well as his disciples. And Jesus asked the Samaritan woman for a drink of water. Food, water, wine are all opportunities to connect with others through a human need. But often these encounters lead themselves to a spiritual connection as well. Well, of the three focuses of physical fitness that we're talking about today, our Hebrew scripture most directly references exercise. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 compares our spiritual journey to that of a physical race. 
stating that we should run with endurance or perseverance the race laid out before us. There are many references in the Bible to physical activity, to running, to walking, to fighting, using our bodies to follow God. And while the Bible doesn't explicitly state anywhere that we should exercise for at least 30 minutes a day, I think we would find this model set for us by Christ himself if we really study how Jesus lived his life. We're told that Jesus was a carpenter, and often when we, when we hear the word carpenter, we think wood, because wood is a resource that is plentiful to our geography here in North America. But if we really think about it, and those of you who visit the Holy Land in March, you can probably attest to this fact, the buildings from Jesus' time were mostly constructed of stone and not wood. So even though images of Jesus often portray him as slender or with a smaller frame, it's actually likely that Jesus was a larger man because he worked lifting stone. And even if he was slender, he would have been really strong because he worked with his hands and with heavy material. In fact, most of the people in Jesus' time worked with their hands, and there were no cars, buses, trains, or planes, so that when they needed to travel, they usually walked everywhere. So physical labor combined with physical travel means that Jesus and others who lived at his time likely exercised at least, but not limited to, 30 minutes a day by virtue of their lifestyle. Now I'm not suggesting that we all sell our cars this afternoon, or that we quit our desk jobs for something more physical, but I am pointing out that the link between exercise and daily work and travel has changed. But God made our bodies magnificently and in his image. So to neglect them simply because we have made great technological advancements seems like we are rejecting the very God who made us. Because we have these great technological advancements like cars and computers, we have the awesome privilege now to push our bodies physically for things like enjoyment, recreation, and sports. So why does it matter if we exercise or if we sit around? Well, we're taught that when we are raised to new life, we will have the same earthly body. Now, it does seem that it will be restored without pain and suffering, but it will be our physical body. So it does matter that we take care of ourselves physically in this life. In the very first verses of Corinthians that we looked at in this Get Fit series, we are told to glorify God with our bodies. Right now, for me, this is running. But there are countless other ways to enjoy and exalt the physical capabilities that God has blessed us with. Even if we have a physical handicap or an injury, I believe God wants us to still find a way to glorify God with what we've been given. We know that Paul had what he referred to as a thorn in his flesh, and many people think that this was a physical disability, yet he still walked miles during his ministry to spread the gospel. In addition, I think we need to be physically prepared for God, what God might call us to. We can certainly serve God without getting fit physically, but our time and method of service will certainly be more limited. If we aren't physically fit, we may not be able to go build houses in the Appalachian Mountains or help out with VBS or take care of a loved one. God can always use us, but why limit how God can use us by not taking care of our bodies? In Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, Gladwell makes the point that although most view David as an underdog in his battle with Goliath, in fact, David was a skilled slinger. He had spent his life preparing for what he thought was to be a shepherd, honing his craft of slinging stones. Yet God decided to use his physical abilities for something far greater. If David had not trained as a slinger, God still could have used him to defeat Goliath. But in fact, God drew on his already developed physical abilities to save his people from an attacking enemy. Finally, just like rest and healthy eating, exercise is a terrific opportunity to connect with God. I very literally wrote the majority of this sermon in my head while running. And I do that pretty much every time I speak. Running is an inexplicable opportunity for me to connect with God while using the phys physical abilities that God has blessed me with. Many of you have probably experienced God while doing exercise or physical activity. And when you really think about it, it's not at all surprising that through our physical abilities that we would connect with a God who made us to experience this world physically. This Get Fit series is all about making positive changes in our lives that bring us closer to God. Perhaps every area of physical fitness in your life, rest, healthy eating, and exercise could use a makeover. 
But again, I'm going to ask you to focus on just one of those areas this week. We have those physical workout plans in your bulletin this week, but start out small. Focus on one area, rest, diet, or exercise, and put your energy and commitment towards making God a part of your decisions this week. Start out small, set a goal, maybe a primary and a secondary goal, and ask for God's help and possibly a friend's help too in achieving it. God cares about our physical fitness because he made us physical beings. Let us exalt God by becoming more physically fit this week and in every week to come. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for the magnificent gift that it is that we have been fashioned in this way, that we have physical earthly bodies. God, we thank you for everything that we're able to do. Lord, we ask that we would be, embrace what we've been given. God, that we would take these bodies that you've given us and we would use them to glorify you. God, we ask for help this week in maybe making some positive changes in the areas of rest and diet and exercise. God, we ask that we could lean on you. We ask that we could lean on others. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to exercise for, for joy and for recreation in our lives. We know that others in many parts of the world exercise because they have to, and God, we need to exercise because we want to we wanna reflect you in our lives. God, we thank you that we have technological advancements in this country, but we ask that we would not take them for granted and that we would still glorify you each day with our bodies. God, we, we lift up to you today physically, um, or those physically who are in need of healing. God, we recognize that um, when the body deteriorates, it's very difficult sometimes to spiritually stay focused and positive. And God, we ask for physical healing and your presence and peace to be with several members of our congregation, specifically Jeanette Ballard and Wa Baston. God, we pray for healing for Jan Burmeister and Jane Cudd. We lift up Doris DeWild and Carolyn Hoffman. We pray for your continued care for Jack Casper and Ed Liddell. And we lift up Nancy Lindquist and Cliff Moore and Peter Staff. We pray for Bob Tilson and Mark Ballard. And Lord, we lift up the family of Judy Smith, who is mourning her loss. God, we lift up each one of these to you and those who are on our minds and our hearts in silence. Lord, we pray all these things in confidence in the name of your Son who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you were with us all the way back on June 1st, we had our one church service at 10 o'clock, and following that we had our picnic. And at that one church service, we commissioned 28 of our students and a few of our adults, excuse me, 28 students and adults to go to Tazewell County, Virginia on an ASP mission trip. Uh, those mission trip participants are here with us this morning to share with us the reflections. Now, before we invite the two to come forward with reflections, I'll let you know that in the back of the sanctuary in our narthex on the table, there is a document that's been compiled by all of the people that went on the trip that have the reflections in them. A few of the students are going to share reflections with us this morning, but you can pick them up on the back table on your way out this morning. So I'd like to invite uh, ben Molitor and Aaron Markley to come forward and share their reflections about their experience on their trip to Tazewell County, Virginia. This year was my first mission trip and our theme was Apostello, or to be sent. I feel I was sent specifically to, uh, to make friends and to deepen the relationships. At first, I was nervous and really apprehensive to go. But after the first day, I knew it was going to be a good week. When we got there, I immediately headed to the gym to check it out, and I was impressed with the quality of the gym and the school. That night, I played basketball until lights out. When we met our residents, George and Pat, I was 
instantly surprised at how generous they were. Whether it be their time or money, they used it to serve others. I was also surprised at how many animals they owned. They had five dogs, uh, three, three cats, one pig, one goat, two roosters, and about 30 chickens. Our work was simple, but very important in the preparation for the siding. We all had jobs. Me and Dylan tore down the old siding and put up OSB and insulated the furnace room. Annie, Shannon, and Aubrey measured, cut, drilled, and put up about 40 to 50 lathing strips. And after all that, they even put up tarp around it too. When it was time to leave, I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay and finish the siding for them. All in all, my week was more than good. It was probably the best week of my life and probably always will be. When I am asked what I did that week, I'll just simply say I helped make someone's life a little bit better. Being on the trip made me feel humbled and honored to help these people. Also, it made me realize how much I personally have taken for granted, like money and a nice house. If someone asks me to go again, I will say yes in a heartbeat. I just wanted to say thank you to the congregation for their support and prayers and to my parents for allowing me to go. Thank you. Hello, my name is Erin Markley, as Pastor Brad said, and this was my first mission trip. Everybody says when they go on their mission trip that this is the best week of summer, and so I was kind of anticipating like a mountaintop experience, but I realized that God can be found in the little things, and it doesn't have to be this big, awe-inspiring moment. Every day after a long, hard day of work, we would sit around and give our God moments. And as the week went on, everybody became a little bit more insightful with their God moments. Back in Rockford, we get all, we get all busy playing sports and school and other miscellaneous things, myself included, that we don't take time to appreciate God's creation. I like to think of myself as a very active and bubbly person, but this week at camp, I found myself oddly calm as I was doing God's work. I saw God in the eyes of my two favorite residents, Zach and Isaac. I saw God in the bond that I created with my crew, and I saw God start to work through me. Going on this trip definitely strengthened my faith, but I by no means have everything figured out, and I'm okay with that, because I realize that not everybody can know everything there is to know about God. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to come on this trip, and I'm grateful for the friendships that I have made and strengthened through ASP. I remember after a long day of driving, we were in, staying at a church in Ohio, and we were trying to figure out how to introduce ourselves to other churches that were going to be there at ASP. Finally, we decided to sing the song Sanctuary, a group favorite, and have a sign with our names on it. And throughout the song, we would flip over the sign, and it would have a word that described how we were feeling going into the week. My word was stretched, and I continually felt that all week. I was stretched in my knowledge of construction, which was little to nothing, stretched in my relationship with God, and stretched in my social skills because I learned to make new friends with other churches. After going on the trip and after completing all of the work, I think my word would be brimming. Brimming with pride over the work that my crew did, brimming with curiosity, about my relationship with God, and brimming with love, ready to give it away just like I had received it at ASB. Thank you. Oh, okay. The video is going to be shown during the offering, I'm told. Uh, at this time, we will receive our tithes and offerings.
Say a prayer. God, we thank you so much for a successful mission trip to Tazewell County, Virginia. We thank you for all the youth that went and the lives that were impacted. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to offer our lives back to you in service. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of the ways that we can offer our lives back to you. And we give you thanks for the commitments that have been made this morning. We pray that you'd bless them and multiply them and use them for work in this world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and join us in our closing song. You know it because we taught it to you. All the people said amen. One, two, three, four.
to go ahead and dismiss the work campers. So they're going to stand in the back of the narthex. So if you have any questions about what happened at work camp, they can tell you. So you guys can walk on back. While they're doing that, I want to remind you that um, Judy Smith's service is going to be on Tuesday at Sunset Funeral Home. So if you'd like to share in the celebration of her life, I invite you to join us. Um, as we go out, summer is a great time to get fit. So if you are making a change in your resting, in your eating, or in your uh, exercise this week, please do it all for the glory of God. Let Him shine through you. Go out in all the love, hope, peace, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's